Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Humanities Forum. Uh, the Humanities Forum is an initiative of the Humanities Program at Providence College, directed by Professor Jim Keating and moderated by Professor Raymond Hain. My name is Pat McFarlane. I teach in the Philosophy Department and in the Development of Western Civilization Program. Because Professor Hain is on sabbatical, he has asked me to help moderate the Humanities Forum this semester. And since I am a very moderate fellow, I'm doing a great job. <laughs> If I don't, which is a little bit immoderate. <laughs> That's a little bit immoderate praise, but nonetheless. The forum is pleased to welcome to campus today a very distinguished guest, Professor Gary Saul Morrison. Professor Morrison has taught in the Department of Slavic Languages since 1986 at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, where he currently holds the Lawrence B. Dumas Distinguished Professorship and since 1991 has been the Francis Hooper Professor of the Arts and Humanities. Professor Morrison has written extensively on Russian literature and literary criticism in scores of monographs, edited books, and articles. His writing has appeared in scholarly journals as well as more popular journals such as the New Criterion, the New York Review of Books, the Jewish Review of Books, and Commentary. <clears throat> Especially worthy of mention in conjunction with the forum's focus this semester is his essay, Solzhenitsyn's Cathedrals, published in the New Criterion in October 2017 and winner of a Sydney Award giver, uh, given for best long form essays. Uh, here's a copy of the New Criterion in which this essay appears. Just, it's a tremendous essay and I would recommend it to each and every one of you. <clears throat> His most recent book is Sense and Sensibility, What Economics Can Learn from the Humanities, co-authored with Morton Shapiro and published in 2017 by Princeton University Press, and now available in paperback, I'm happy to report. That's Sense and Sensibility, Sense, C-E-N-T-S, and Sensibility. Professor Morrison has won numerous awards for his scholarship and teaching. He was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1995. We are honored that he is with us today. Will you please help me in welcoming Professor Gary Saul Morrison to Providence College. Well, I'm really honored um, to be here. Uh, it, it's already been enlightening. Um, there aren't too many places like this that exist, and um, it really is different from where I... Uh, can you all hear me? Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, from wh where I'm usually from. Uh, I'll just mention that the we're working on a sequel to that book, Sense and Sensibility, which goes the reverse way, what humanists can learn from economics, the reverse. And that will be called Price and Prejudice. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 No. I am uh, abashed that I'm coming here right after uh, Dan Mahoney. If I had known, I would never have done such a thing, because uh, Dan is, you know, the great, the world's great Solzhenitsyn scholar, and you know, it's a hard act to follow. Um, this talk is called Literature and Torture, and in case you are tortured, I will tell you that it is in advance. It's in nine parts. That way you know how much more you have to sit through at any, at a, any given point. So part one is simply called <clears throat> Russian Literature. Solzhenitsyn's three-volume epos, uh, um, The Gulag Archipelago, which many have called the most important masterpiece of the 20th century, is subtitled, An Experiment in Literary Investigation. Consider how odd that is. No Westerner would call such a work literary, lest someone discount its documentary value. Literature is one thing, truth another, isn't that correct? But Solzhenitsyn insists that absolutely everything included is strictly factual. What then is literary about the book? <clears throat> it's worth noting that Russia's most recent winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, Svetlana Alexeyevich, also produced literary works that were purely factual. 
With these two writers, we encounter something essential to the Russian tradition. Russians revere literature more than anyone else in the world. When Tolstoy's novel Anna Karenina was being serialized, Dostoevsky, <coughs> in a review of its latest installment, opined that, quote, at last the existence of the Russian people has been justified. Unquote. It is hard to imagine Frenchmen or Englishmen, let alone Americans, even supposing that their existence required justification. But if they did, they would surely not point to a novel. Would we mention the iPhone? But for Russians, Dostoevsky's comment appeared unremarkable. We usually assume that literature exists to depict life, but Russians often speak as if life exists to provide material for literature. Russians, of course, excel in other things, in ballet, chess, opera, and mathematics. They invented the periodic table of the elements and non-Euclidean geometry. Nevertheless, for Russians, literature is in a class by itself. The very phrase, Russian literature, carries for them a sacramental aura. The closest analogy may be the status of the Bible for ancient Hebrews when it was still possible to add books to it. Solzhenitsyn claimed in his Nobel Prize speech, quote, Writers can vanquish lies. In the struggle against lies, art has always won and always will. Lies can stand up against much in the world, but not against art. According to the Russian proverb, one word of truth outweighs the world, unquote. For a Russian writer who survived seven years in the gulag, such statements were not mere rhetoric, as they would be if uttered by an American writer, that is, if an American writer could do so with a straight face. In assuming the role of Russian writer, Solzhenitsyn was claiming a status less comparable to American writer than to Hebrew prophet. One of his characters asks, quote, hasn't it always been understood that a major writer in our country is a sort of second government, unquote. In Russia, Boris Pasternak explained, quote, a book is a squarish chunk of hot smoking conscience and nothing else, unquote. When the writer Vladimir Korolenko, who was half Ukrainian, was asked his nationality, he famously replied, my homeland is Russian literature. <laughs> In her 2015, Nobel Prize address, Svetlana Alexeyevich echoed Karolenko by claiming three homelands, her mother's Ukraine, her father's Belarus, and, quote, Russia's great culture without which I cannot imagine myself, unquote. By culture, <coughs> she meant, above all, literature. Russia's most influential 19th century critic, Nikolai Chernyshevsky, explained, quote, in those countries where intellectual and social life has attained a high level of development, one can speak of a division of labor among the various branches of intellectual activity. Only one of these branches is known to us, literature. For that reason, literature plays a greater role in our intellectual life than French, German, and English literature play in the intellectual life of their respective countries, and it bears greater responsibility than the literature of any other nation. Russian literature has the direct duty of taking an interest in the kind of subject matter that has elsewhere passed into the special competence of other fields of intellectual activity, unquote. Thus, the greatest works of Russian thought, typically called philosophy, typically take the form of literary criticism. Mikhail Bakhtin's remarkable contribution to linguistics, psychology, folkloristics, and theology occur in books on Dostoevsky, Rabelais, and the theory of the novel. Russian intellectual histories typically focused almost entirely on literary authors and critics, as no one would do in England, where that would mean omitting Isaac Newton, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Adam Smith, and Charles Darwin. <coughs> Chernyshevsky's disciple Dob Dobrolyubov justified interpreting, quote, the phenomena of life on the basis of literary production, unquote, 
by arguing that great writers are, consciously or not, <clears throat> the greatest sociologists. Quote, we have no way other, we have no other way of knowing what is beginning to permeate and predominate in the moral life of society but literature. The author artist, although not troubling to draw any general conclusions about the state of public thought and morality, is always able to grasp their most essential features. I'm still quoting. As soon as it is recognized that an author artist possesses talent, that is, the ability to feel and depict the phenomena with lifelike truth, this very recognition creates legitimate grounds for taking his production as a basis for the discussion of that epoch, unquote. To be sure, a writer, he says, cannot begin with a thesis. He must rather use his writerly sensitivity to intuit what is going on, even if he cannot understand its implications. It is that sensitivity, and not only technical skill, however, that makes him a great writer. Though they hated Dobrodubov, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy would surely have agreed. Part two is called Limited Experience. Once in the West, Solzhenitsyn was understandably bewildered when Westerners were put off by his moral earnestness. They didn't like, quote, how closely I identified with what I was portraying. In the West nowadays, the colder and more aloof the author and the more a literary work departs from reality, <clears throat> transforming it into a game, the higher the work is esteemed, unquote. I had sinned against both existing literary norms and, quote, political decency, unquote. The very intellectuals who had once defended him condemned him when they discovered he did not share some of their views. Above all, they could not entertain the possibility that they had something to learn from a very different set of experiences. That really mattered even more than the difference of views. No, no, it was only his experience that was eccentric, while theirs reflected the way things really are. Foolishly, this survivor of communist slave labor camps revealed himself, quote, to be an enemy of socialism, unquote. Solzhenitsyn recalls a Canadian TV commentator who, quote, lectured me that I presumed to judge the experience of the world from the viewpoint of my own limited Soviet and prison camp experience. Indeed, how true. Life and death, imprisonment and hunger, the cultivation of the soul despite the captivity of the body, how very limited that is compared to the bright world of political parties, yesterday's numbers on the stock exchange, amusements without end, and exotic foreign travel, unquote. What most disturbed Solzhenitsyn was, quote, a surprising uniformity of opinion, unquote, that life was about individual happiness. What else could it be about? And that it was somehow impolite to refer without irony to evil. Still worse, Solzhenitsyn traced this trivializing of human experience to, quote, the notion that man is the center of all that exists and that there is no higher power above him. And these roots of irreligious humanism, he says, are common to the current Western world and to communism. And that, he says, is what has led the Western intelligentsia to such strong and dogged sympathy for communism, unquote. After the gulag, such ostensibly sophisticated sympathy seemed, at best, the most hopeless naivete. Part three is called Tears from Tolstoy. But wasn't Solzhenitsyn himself once an atheist and communist? Indeed he was. And the gulag archipelago narrates how, bit by bit, he changed his view of life. The book is not only a documentary, but also an autobiography. And because Solzhenitsyn's experience was shared by so many others, Gulag offers itself as a collective autobiography, an odd form, you have to say. I was arrested this way. Here, other ways, others were arrested. I suffered this brutal interrogation. Others underwent these other kinds of torture. As we examine the progress of souls in extreme conditions, a story, or rather a set of closely related stories, unfolds, and these suspenseful narratives command considerable dramatic interest. One way the book works as literature is as a sort of encyclopedia of possible novels. 
Stalin famously remarked, one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. Literature exists to make us imagine a million tragedies. For all prisoners, the first discovery was of unprecedented evil, evil they could never have imagined in as pure a form as possible. One way Solzhenitsyn conveys this evil is to compare it with other supposed embodiments of it, especially the czarist regime, which throughout the Western world was regarded as the symbol of pure oppression. Solzhenitsyn reflects, from 1876 to 1904, a period when Russian terrorists, Russia invented modern terrorism, when Russian terrorists killed many top officials, including Tsar Alexander II, the regime executed in reprisal 486 people, or 17 per year. From 1905 to 1908, including the period of the revolution of 1905, executions rocketed upwards to 2,200 or 45 per month before coming to an abrupt halt. Such brutality, quote, astounded Russian imaginations, calling forth tears from Tolstoy and indignation from Karolyanka. Of course, from 1917 to the death of Stalin in 1953, 2,200 was about the number of people killed on an average day. Solzhenitsyn often cites the memoirs of the revolutionary Ivan Razumnik, who compared his imprisonment under czars and Soviets. Under the czars, interrogation never involved torture, while under the Soviets, it was routine. In 1937, it actually was mandatory. The czars never thought of arresting relatives of criminals, relatives of criminals, but the Soviets built camps for, quote, the wise of the accused, unquote. In some periods, their children were put in orphanages, where most died, while in others, they were simply executed. The czars never conducted arrests at random, but Stalin issued quotas for each district, and Lenin, explained, and Lenin explicitly called for arbitrary execution of innocent people, since killing the innocent, he explained, would create a terrorized, therefore submissive population. These are not views attributed to him. This is his views that he says himself. The comment about the tears of Tolstoy exhibits the peculiar irony with which Gulag is narrated. Indeed, the book's closest literary relative is probably Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which is also a masterpiece of history told as irony. But even Gibbon never produced passages as savage as this one. I quote, if the intellectuals in the plays of Chekhov who spent all their time guessing what would happen in 20, 30, or 40 years, had been told that in 40 years interrogation by torture would be practiced in Russia, that prisoners would have their skulls squeezed within iron rings, that a human being would be loaded, lowered into an acid bath, that they would be trussed up naked to be bitten by ants and bedbugs, that a ramrod heated over a primus stove would be thrust up their anal canal, the secret brand, that a man's genitals would be slowly crushed beneath the toe of a jackboot, and that in the luckiest possible circumstances, prisoners would be tortured by being kept from sleeping for a week, by thirst, and by being beaten to a bloody pulp, not one of Chekhov's plays would have gotten to its end because all the heroes would have gone off to insane asylums." Unquote. What sort of people were these interrogators and the people who directed them? What went through their minds? The unprecedented Soviet experience raised these questions as never before, although the Nazi, Maoist, Khmer Rouge, and other totalitarian regimes to follow were to do so again. Part four is called Stalin or Macbeth. Solzhenitsyn opines, compared to Soviet interrogators, the villains of Shakespeare, Schiller, and Dickens seem, quote, somewhat farcical and clumsy to our contemporary perception, unquote. The problem is, these villains recognize themselves as evil and say to themselves, I cannot live unless I do evils. 
sort of, you know, as in Spider-Man. But that is not at all the way things are, Solzhenitsyn explains. Quote, to do evil, a human being must first of all believe that what he's doing is good, or else it is a well-considered act in conformity with natural law. It is in the nature of a human being to seek a justification for his actions, unquote. Why is it, Solzhenitsyn asks, that Macbeth, Iago, and other Shakespearean evildoers stopped short at a dozen corpses while Lenin and Stalin did in millions. The answer, he says, is that Macbeth and Iago, quote, had no ideology, unquote. Ideology makes the killer and torturer an agent of good, quote, so that he won't hear reproaches and curses, but will receive praise and honors, unquote. Ideology never achieves such power and scale before the 20th century. Anyone can succumb to ideology. All it takes is a sense of one's own moral superiority for being on the right side, a theory that purports to explain everything, and this is crucial, a principled refusal to see things from the point of view of one's opponents, lest one be tainted by their evil viewpoint. If we remember that totalitarians and terrorists think of themselves as warriors for justice, we can appreciate how good people can join them. Lev Kopeliev, the model for Solzhenitsyn's character Rubin in his novel, The First Circle, describes how, as a young man, he went to the countryside to help enforce the collectivization of agriculture. Bolshevik policy included the enforced starvation of some seven million peasants. There are a couple of wonderful books on this, by the way. And Kopeliev describes how he was able to take morsels of food, quote, from women and children with distended bellies, turning blue, still breathing, but with vacant, lifeless eyes, unquote, in the ardent conviction that he was building socialism. Other memoirs of this period also describe how a loyal communist at last awoke to what he did. In this way, the Soviet experience inspired a rebirth of conversion literature and Solzhenitsyn's gulag, which details his own change from Bolshevik to Christian, is a prime example. Part five is called <clears throat> The White Mantle of the Just. Each conversion memoir reports that change was immensely hard. For one thing, as Arthur Kester's novel Darkness at Noon correctly divined, the party was one's purpose in life and constituted one's whole family. Challenging it was as unthinkable as simultaneously renouncing one's education and all one's friends and relatives. For another, one was taught that Marx's theory was a hard science, which had proved that human sacrifice was as inevitable uh, to saving humanity as surgical cutting is to an operation. Common metaphor. To build communism for in innumerable future generations of perfect people, the sacrifice of the relatively few imperfect homunculi of the present was a small price to pay. As it was often phrased, the deaths were caused not by us, but by history with a capital H. What is more, <clears throat> the people killed were class enemies, which meant that even if they had not committed counter-revolutionary crimes, they were potential criminals. Vasily Grossman, the first writer to report the Holocaust when he saw it unfolding on Nazi-occupied Soviet territory, was not unique in pointing out that the exact equivalent of the Nazi category of race was the Soviet category of class. Social class, like race, was inherited, not chosen. You were, your parents were bourgeois, and that's it. And could not be changed. In the newspaper Red Terror, I'm not making that title up. In the newspaper Red Terror, Felix Dzerzhinsky, the founder of the secret police, the Cheka, explained in 1918, quote, we are not fighting against single individuals. We are exterminating the bourgeoisie as a class. It is not necessary during the interrogation to look for evidence proving that the accused opposed the Soviets by word or action. The first question which you should ask him is what class does he belong to? What is his origin, his education, 
and his profession? These are the questions which will determine the fate of the accused. Such is the sense and essence of red terror, unquote. Or as one of Grossman's characters observes, quote, the concept of innocence is a holdover from the Middle Ages, unquote. Solzhenitsyn reports how it was mere chance that he did not become supremely evil. He doesn't paint himself as a saint in this book. When he was finishing his education, he and his classmates were offered the opportunity to do something nobler than physics, a job of great moral importance, which also entailed social prestige and material reward. They could attend the NKVD secret police training school. These students had been raised to regard the NKVD as a supremely moral organization. Realizing how <coughs> close he came to becoming interrogator himself, Solzhenitsyn reflects, quote, and just so we don't go around flaunting too proudly the white mantle of the just, let everyone ask himself, if my life had turned out differently, might I myself have not become just such an executioner? It is a dreadful question if one answers it honestly. Solzhenitsyn turned down this coveted offer out of some inner intuition, quote, not founded on rational argument. It certainly didn't derive from the lectures on historical materialism that we listened to. It was clear from them that the struggle against the internal enemy was, as crucial a battle, was a crucial battlefront, and to share in it was an honorable task. It was not our minds that resisted, but something inside our breasts. People can shout at you from all sides, you must, but inside your breast there is a sense of revulsion, repudiation. I don't want to. It makes me feel sick. Do what you want with me. I want no part of it, unquote. And yet, he reflects, some of us did join. And if enough pressure had been applied, perhaps all of us would have. In that case, quote, what would I have become? The passage that follows is one of the book's most famous. Quote, so let the reader who expects this book to be a political expose slam the cover shut right now. If only it were so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who was willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? From good to evil is but a quaver, says the Russian proverb, and correspondingly, from evil to good, unquote. I think of my favorite English proverb, perhaps the foundation of ethics. There, but for the grace of God, go I. It is worth clarifying what Solzhenitsyn is arguing against. For Marxists, for ideologues, and justice warriors generally, <coughs> Our group is good and theirs is evil. Quote, evil people committing evil deeds, unquote. That is the sort of thinking behind notions like class conflict or the international Zionist conspiracy. It is the opposite of the idea that makes tolerance and democracy possible. The idea that there is legitimate difference of opinion and we must not act as if God or history had blessed our side as always right. If you think that way, there is no reason not to have a one-party state. The man who taught me Russian history, the late Firuz Kazemzadeh, used to say, remember, there are always as many swine on your side as on the other. Your heart is not good or evil once and for all. Sometimes our heart, quote, is squeezed by exuberant evil. Sometimes it shifts to allow space for good to flourish. One and the same human being is at various ages, under various circumstances, close to being a devil, at times to sainthood, unquote. We are never closer to evil than when we think the line between good and evil passes between groups and not through each human heart, including our own. Part six is called Bolshevik Ethics. <clears throat> 
Let me return to the passage in which Solzhenitsyn imagines Chekhov's character as learning about the secret brand. Beginning in mid-1937, every interrogated prisoner was subject to torture, and there were a few millions arrested then. Such Soviet practices raises a question that Solzhenitsyn, along with Grossman, Nadezhda Mandelstam, the great memoirist, Balam Shalama, the fabulous short story writer, and other writers have sought to answer, why engage in such practices? What purpose could they possibly serve? Consider Solzhenitsyn's chapter on how prisoners were transported to camps. Typically, they were loaded into cattle cars. This, by the way, was true for decades. It didn't change you know, even under Brezhnev when people were sent out there, just fewer of them. Uh, they were loaded into cattle cars, unheated in winter, unventilated in summer, packed as densely as possible, meaning that sometimes there was so little space that prisoners hung between others without their legs reaching the floor. They were barely fed or fed on salt herring and not given water. Some days, <coughs> they weren't fed at all. Soon, the prisoners, quote, started to die off, and the guards hauled the corpses out from under their feet. Not right away, true, but only on the second day. In this way, a trip from Moscow to Petropavlovsk took three weeks, unquote. With his trademark irony, Solzhenitsyn repeats that none of this was done to torture the prisoners. He rejects that explanation. What he means, we soon understand, is that such treatment was so routine it did not count as torture. Why treat people like this? If the point was to kill them, it was a lot easier to shoot them straight off as in fact was done to millions. If the point was to provide manpower for the slave labor camps, that's what Anne Applebaum says in her new book on the Gulag, then why let so many laborers die en route? To answer this question, one must first grasp Bolshevik ethics. So far as I know, it has no precedent in world history. That's why it's so hard to believe. Bolshevik ethics explicitly began and ended with atheism. Only someone who rejected all religious or quasi-religious morals could be a Bolshevik because, as Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, and other Bolshevik leaders insisted, the only standard of right and wrong was success for the party. Not the supreme, the only. The bourgeoisie falsely claim we have no ethics, Lenin explained in a 1920 speech. But what we reject is any ethics based on God's commandments or anything resembling them, such as abstract principles, timeless values, universal human rights, or any tenet of philosophical idealism. For a true materialist, Lenin maintained, there can be no Kantian categorical imperative to use others only as ends, not as means. By the same token, the materialist does not acknowledge the impermissibly, impermissibility of lying or the supposed sanctity of human life, a phrase always used with irony. All such notions, Lenin insisted, quote, are, quote, based on extra-human and extra-class concepts, unquote, and so are simply religion in disguise. Quote, that is why we say that to us, there is no such thing as a morality that stands outside human society. It's a fraud. To us, morality is subordinated to the interests of the proletariat's class struggle, unquote, which means to the party. Aaron Soltz, <coughs> known as, quote, the conscience of the party, unquote, explained, quote, we can say openly and frankly, yes, we hold in prison those who interfere with the establishment of our order, and we do not stop before other such actions because we do not believe in the existence of abstractly unethical actions, unquote. Until recently, I suppose such statement meant that if it should be necessary to kill people, then it is permissible to do so. And that's what Russia's greatest anarchist, Peter Kropotkin, had maintained. But the Bolsheviks rejected this formulation as sheer sentimentality. Kropotkin's way of thinking suggests that revolutionaries must meet a burden of proof to overcome the moral law against killing. <clears throat> No more killing than necessary. For the Bolsheviks, there was no such moral law to overcome. 
The only moral criterion was the interest of the party, and so they trained followers to overcome their instinctive compassion. Reluctance to kill reflected an essentially religious or, quote, abstract humanist, unquote, belief in the sanctity of human life. For a true atheist to acknowledge any moral standard outside, quote, human society, which meant outside the party, is, if you will excuse the expression, anathema. The result was the very opposite of Kropotkinism. Violent means were to be preferred. Everyone knew that to hesitate before cruelty was to reveal a quasi-theological morality, the, which wasn't healthy. The way to prove one's atheism, then, was to be as ruthless as possible. Mercy, kindness, compassion, these were all anti-Bolshevik emotions, and schoolchildren were explicitly taught to reject them. I know of no previous society where children were taught that compassion and mercy, per se, are vices. The older heroes of Solzhenitsyn's novel, In the First Circle, grow wary of young Ruska because, quote, Ruska's whole generation had been trained to think of pity as a degrading sentiment, of kindness as comic, and of conscience as priest's talk. On the other hand, it had been drilled into them that informing was a patriotic duty, unquote. Since compassion could only reflect values not derivable from materialism, the result was what a character in one of Grossman's novels referred to as a reverse categorical imperative. Quote, a categorical imperative composed to Kant, unquote, always use people as objects. Do unto class enemies what you would not want them to do unto you. That is why, starting in mid-1937, torture became mandatory. What objection could be raised? Ruthlessness without prompting demonstrated that one harbored no abstract moral standard, even unconsciously. It was positively good to arrest the innocent. When Stalin assigned arrest quotas, local NKVD branches usually asked to arrest even more. Kopolyev recalled, quote, our great goal was the universal triumph of communism. And for the sake of that goal, everything was permissible. To lie, to steal, to destroy hundreds of thousands, even millions of people. And to hesitate or doubt about all this was to give in to, quote, intellectual squeamishness and, quote, stupid liberalism, unquote. The attributes of people who, quote, could not see the forest for the trees, end of passage. In her memoir, Hope Against Hope, Nadezhda Mandelstam reflects on how the value of words changed. Quote, she says, the word conscience had gone out of ordinary use. It was not current in newspapers, books, or the schools since its function had been taken over by class feeling. Kindness became something to be ashamed of, and its exponents were as extinct as the mammoth." Unquote. Positive words now included merciless and ruthless, as well as total, as in total extermination, immediate, as in immediate execution, and mass, as in mass resettlement or mass terror along with only, without exception, without compromise, and no halfway measures. It was good to string these terms together. In 1939, for instance, a secret directive insisted that, quote, the only correct strategy is a merciless struggle against the whole Cossack elite by means of their total extermination. No compromises, no halfway measures are permissible, unquote. This is, anyone who's read Bolshevik rhetoric, will, you know, this is really commonplace. Prominent prosecutor Nikolai Krylenko offered a true Bolshevik apology once. Quote, in the period of dictatorship, that's, he means the period of the Civil War, surrounded on all sides by enemies, we sometimes manifested unnecessary leniency and unnecessary soft-heartedness, unquote. Not unnecessary cruelty, but unnecessary leniency required forgiveness. A speaker at the Party Congress in 1925 reminisced, quote, Lenin used to teach us that every party member should be a Cheka, secret police agent. The line was quoted 
thousands and thousands of times. That is, he should watch and inform. If we suffer from one thing, it is that we do not do enough informing, unquote. <clears throat> we saw an explanation um, for those cattle cars, for those prisoner cattle cars, but it should now be clear that it is not cruelty that requires explanation, but the reverse. As we might phrase the point today, cruelty was the default setting. Anything else would be inconsistent with atheism and materialism. It would suggest some standard other than success in this world. Part seven is called The Great Conversion. Is it any wonder that many Russians began to accept absolute standards of right and wrong? This was the great conversion. They discovered what Solzhenitsyn calls conscience, by which he means the conviction that good and evil are one thing and effectiveness is quite another. Kopolyev, Solzhenitsyn, and others describe the key event of their life as the discovery that just as the universe contains causal laws, it also contains objective moral laws. Bolshevik horror derived from the opposite view, that there is nothing inexplicable in materialist terms and that the only moral standard is political success. In her celebrated memoir, Into the Whirlwind, Evgenia Ginsberg describes how her NKVD interrogator tempted her to implicate another person who, he said, had already denounced her. That's between him and his conscience, she demurred, thereby appealing to a moral standard independent of consequences. What are you, a gospel Christian or something, the inter interrogator replied. Just honest, she said, an answer that provoked him to give her, quote, a lecture on the Marxist-Leninist view of ethics. Honest meant useful to the proletariat and to the state, unquote. As a good Leninist herself, Ginsburg has to agree. She has invoked standards that a Christian, but not a committed atheist, would accept, and she has to acknowledge it. Quote, an objective moral order is built into the universe, unquote, declares the autobiographical hero of In the First Circle. One of his friends concurs, quote, we ought to spell good and evil not just with capitals, but with letters five stories high, unquote. Part eight is called testing ideas. Many, including Solzhenitsyn, took the next step and accepted God. Why not remain an atheist who believes in, in an absolute moral law? Here again, we must understand the thought-shaping power of Russian literature, particularly Russia's specialty, the great realist fiction of ideas. Great realist novels test ideas not by their logical coherence, as in academic philosophy, but by the consequences of believing them. Novels of ideas, whether by George Eliot or Tolstoy, Joseph Conrad or Dostoevsky, Henry James or Turgenev, exhibit a master plot. The hero or heroine devoted to an idea discovers that reality <coughs> excuse me, is much more complex than the idea allows. For example, a materialist believes that love is nothing but physiology and that individual people differ no more than frogs, yet falls deeply in love with a particular woman. That's the plot of Turgenev's novel, Fathers and Children. A moralist insists that only actions, not wishes, have moral value, yet winds up consumed by guilt for a murder he has fostered only by his wish for it. That's the plot of Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov. For Inakenti Volodin, the Epicurean hero of In the First Circle, the experience of arrest shows the limitation of his favorite philosopher's ideas. Epi um, Epicurus, the great materialist of the ancient world, had said, quote, you should not fear physical suffering. Prolonged suffering is always insignificant. Significant suffering is of short duration, unquote. But what if you're deprived for days of sleep in a box without air? What about 10 years of solitary confinement in a cell where you cannot stretch your legs? Is that significant or insignificant, he said. For Lord then recalls Epicurus's words, quote, our inner feelings of satisfaction and dissatisfaction are the highest criteria of good and evil, unquote. And only now does he understand them. Now, quote, now it was clear, whatever gives me pleasure is good, what displeases me is bad. 
Stalin, for instance, enjoyed killing people, so that for him was good, unquote. How wise philosophy seems to a free person. But for Volodin, good and evil are now distinct entities. Quote, his struggle and suffering had raised him to a height from which the great materialist, as Epicurus's wisdom, seemed like the prattle of a child. Thinking novelistically, Solzhenitsyn asks, how well does morality uh, without God pass the test of Soviet experience? Every camp prisoner, sooner or later, faces a choice whether or not to resolve to survive at any price. Do you take the food or shoes of a weaker prisoner? Quote, this is the great fork of camp life. From this point, the roads go to the right and to the left. If you go to the right, you lose your life. If you go to the left, you lose your conscience, unquote. Memoirs after memoirs, including atheists like Evgenia Ginsburg, report that those who denied anything beyond the material world were the first to choose survival. They may have insisted that high moral ideals do not require a belief in God, but when it came right down to it, Morals grounded in nothing but one's own conviction and reasoning, however cogent, proved woefully inadequate under experiential rather than logical pressure. In Valam Shalama's Kalima Tales, in my view, the best collection of short stories since Chekhov, a narrator observes the intellectual becomes, um, the intellectual becomes a coward, and his own brain provides a justification of his own actions. He can persuade himself of anything as needed, unquote. Among Gulag memoirists, even the atheists acknowledge that the only people who did not succumb morally were the believers. Which religion they professed did not seem to matter. Ginsburg describes how a group of semi-literate believers refused to go out to work on Easter Sunday. In the Siberian cold, they were made to stand barefoot on an ice-covered pond where they continued to chant their prayers. Later that night, the rest of us argued about the believer's behavior. Quote, was this fanaticism or fortitude in defense of the rights of conscience? Were we to admire them or regard them as mad? And most troubling of all, should we have had the courage to act as they did, unquote? The recognition that they would not often transformed people into believers. And the last section is called simply a blessing. Read his autobiography, the key moment of Gulag may be Solzhenitsyn's conversation with, quote, a pale, yellowish youth with a Jewish tenderness of face, unquote, named Boris Gamadov. Solzhenitsyn uh, happened to mention a prayer by President Roosevelt and, quote, expressed what seemed to me a self-evident evaluation of it. Well, that's hypocrisy, of course, unquote. Gamadov replied, why do you not admit the possibility that a political leader might sincerely believe in God? And quote. And that was all he said. But what a direction that attack had come from. To hear such words from someone born in 1923, six years after the revolution, I could have replied to him very firmly, but prison had already undermined my certainty. And the principal thing was that some kind of clean, pure feeling does live within us existing apart from all our convictions. And then it dawned on me that I had not spoken out of conviction, but because the idea had been implanted in me from outside. And because of this, I merely asked him, do you believe in God? Of course, he answered tranquilly. Was it not here in these prison cells that the great truth dawned, unquote? The great truth dawned. Unexpectedly, astonishingly, this harrowing story of cattle cars and the secret brand has a happy ending. A person, not a hero, just a flawed person, finds faith. Everybody's been indoctrinated with the slogan that in a material world, nothing beyond the laws of nature exists. Quote, the result is all that counts. But camp experience, I'm quoting from Children Edson, taught us that this was a lie. It is not the result that counts, but the spirit, unquote. Once you realize this, quote again, then imprisonment begins to transform your character in an astonishing way, unquote.
you begin to appreciate friendship differently. Recognizing your own weakness, you understand the weakness of others. When another prisoner relates how he became a Christian, Solzhenitsyn recognizes that when he had been most certain he was doing good, he was actually doing evil. He understands, quote, the truth of all the religions of the world. They struggle with the evil inside a human being, every human being, unquote. He reflects on prison and on literature. I quote, Leo Tolstoy was right when he dreamed of being put in prison. I have served enough time there. I nourish my soul there. And I say without hesitation, bless you, prison, for having been in my life. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Morrison, for that great talk. Um, uh, we have a microphone here, and I think you can. I think we can detach this one too, if you want to use it to walk around. Um, <laughs> uh, we usually uh, open the floor to students first. Uh, is there any any questions or comments that any anybody here, as a student, would like to make uh, before we open up the um, floor to other? Uh, People, old, <laughs> other friends, huh? Sal? Yes, you have to ask a free question. <laughs> Sal, go ahead. What do you want to ask? You must volunteer. Yeah. You volunteer. You've made me at this point. Um, kind of, a bunch of us who are here are in um, like a Russian kind of literature class, kind of dealing with Solzhenitsyn, and we've already started Dostoevsky. And kind of a point that keeps being brought up is that Russian literature has this very unique perspective on like the human character. Like it's this idea that humanity are, you know, we're flawed, but there's good and evil and it's intermixed. And it's something you don't get with like when Greek mythology, you know, there are flaws, but they're larger than life characters. It seems to be like Russian literature has these just small vignettes of people who in their everyday life display both characters of both good and evil. And is that just something uniquely Russian? Do you find, or? No, I don't think that's uniquely Russian. I mean, I think um, if you look at, let's say, the literary form I, I love the most, the realist novel, as you can probably tell, that's true of the realist novel generally. Um, there are no saints. There are no purely evil people. If they are, they, they're two-dimensional and are not proper novelistic characters. Um, so anyone who in a realist novel sees somebody else as purely good or purely evil, you are, can be sure, is not seeing correctly. I mean, that, that's a given. That isn't true in all literature. For example, um, I wrote my first book about utopian fiction. And in utopian fiction, anybody who does not divide the world into the good and the evil is mistaken. So the novel and utopia are antithetical literary forms. They represent different worldviews. Um, I guess what's specific about the Russians is that they are willing to ask these questions explicitly. The, they make the philosophical questions their core. That was, for most Western novelists, that was difficult. I mean, Stendhal has a famous line where he says, you know, politics or philosophy in a novel is like a pistol shot in a concert. You know, not everybody goes so far. There's certainly um, implicit philosophy in Jane Austen. It's not spelled out, but it's clearly there. She's interested in how, um, well, by pride and prejudice, we deceive ourselves and do not perceive what's there and how that happens. Um, and I say there are philosophical novels by um, other great writers, like George Eliot, who I think is more like a Russian novelist than anybody else outside of Russia. Um, but she was a translator of German philosophy, too, so that was, you know, part of her makeup. Uh, what Russians take ideas to their extreme, and they test them in their extreme form, and far from being an embarrassment, uh, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what literature exists for, to give guidance to life. 
Um, and so, you know, you'll get passages lo like this. Um, I don't think any of the great um, English or other European American realist novelists would disagree with Solzhenitsyn on that the line between good and evil goes through every human heart. I don't think you'd find this anything resembling an explicit statement like that. Um, and I don't, you certainly will not have that idea tested by extreme conditions, the other Russian specialty. Um, take everything to an extreme or test it under extreme conditions. Um, you don't have to imagine them in Russia. Um, but that's the difference. But I think it's, you know, Greek mythology, yeah, it's not realist novels. But I think what you're really looking for there is um, the worldview of realist novels. And this is why, um, you know, my favorite Russian philosopher, Mikhail Bakhtin, wrote so many of his works on the nature of the novel as a genre, which he conceived of the realist novel is itself a philosophical worldview. Right? And you, to understand novels, it, every genre has an implicit view of the world, how cause happens, how time flows, how, whether human beings stay the same or grow over time, what right and wrong are, what, whether there's agency or we're just you know, driven by external forces. He thought that the realist novel had the truest view of the world, and the only one that gives morality, as he understood it, a strong representation and meaning. Uh, and so writing about it, he was writing about a certain view of life, a certain philosophy. And what you just, you know, the point you just made there, it would be part of what he would say, that's why I love realist novels, and I'm going to explain to you how they do this. You know? um, so it's a great question. Thank you. Rick. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. You, you mentioned that um, ideology allows for people to do extraordinary evil, and you also mentioned that, that uh, the 20th century was the time period where ideology had received the most uh, power, most, most um, yeah, power. Um, does social needs in, or do you have a, a theory as to what happened in the, you know, what, what, why did mm -hmm. all of a sudden ideology, which I presume existed for Solzhenitsyn before the 20th century, but why all of a sudden did it, did it just sort of unleash such, such destruction, especially there in the early 20th century? I, I'm going to have to guess about, about that one. It's a really good question. Um, but my guess is that the, the ideology that matters is a particular type of ideology. Um, l let me see if I can um, give some intellectual history here. Um, one of the amazing things about Newton's discoveries is that in a vast amount of incredibly complicated phenomena, if you've ever seen diagrams of how the solar system worked before Newton with circles on circles and circles, all sorts of patterns, you could explain all that in terms of four simple laws. Three laws of motion, the laws of, of gravitation. That became the model from that point on for what a social science should look like. If Newton can do it for astronomy, we should be a, and you had people after people trying to develop a hard social science. The point is that th this is why Marxism can claim to be a hard science. It's not just a philosophy. It's not like the Federalist Papers. You can, it, it's a whole different sort of thing. It's a sense that all morality can be, can be derived from it. All causality can be derived from it. You know, they would, theories of physics were arbitrated by whether they conformed or not to, to this. That's really, I think, a product of this intellectual revolution. Um, one intellectual historian calls it moral Newtonianism. Um, you know, you have other examples of it, um, trying to develop it, like um, Jeremy Bentham, right? Um, I don't know. You, Freud doesn't go quite that far. He's got that spirit, but a lot of his followers would, you know, would, would have taken it that far. Um, and it's when an ideology like that gets into power, an ideology that cannot be wrong because it is science. 
That's when you really have, when, when people, there can be no other moral stance, political stance, social stance, because any more than, than you know, there can be another law of gravitation. That was, by the way, the explanation that was always given. Under Brezhnev, they very often put you know, intellectuals in insane asylums under the, the belief, which I think was in many cases sincere, that to doubt Marxism, Leninism, is like doubting the law of gravity. You think things fall up? I think that was genuinely sincere. I don't, that's very different from just a philosophy. Okay, that's what I think, you know, is the difference. And it actually first gains control in Russia. Lenin certainly thought that way. Um, and then, you know, you get it spreading, you know, spreading elsewhere. That, but I'm guessing that's the sort of ideology. Ideology was too vague a term for him to use. He should have specified, you know, and, and I'm putting words in about how he means this, but... Um, uh, Marxism and liberalism are both, in some sense, ideologies, but not in this sense are they both ideology. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Thanks for that super great talk. Um, Thank you. I, I'm, I'm wondering, because what you have in the 20th century, I mean, ideology in some ways is just an explanation of the world. You can have simplistic ones, right. and, and, you know, more complex ones. You can ones that divide people between evil and good and all that kinds of stuff. Right. However, in the 20th century, where ideology turns so murderous and so genocidal, whether, that, whether the genus is, is class or ethnicity, uh -huh. right? Um, you have something else, which is you have the removal, or at least among the elite, the removal of any objective moral standards. Right. right? So well, there's one objective moral standard, which is the ideology itself. Well, yeah, okay, that would be the objective. Right. Yeah. Okay, fine, but it's not, well, I guess it's in light of a moral vision, but what you can do to human beings in order to right. attain that vision seems to have no particular check on it. Absolutely not, right. Right, and so you, because the two, the three, the four most murderous regimes of the 20th century, they were all secular, right? Uh, the Bolshevik, the uh, Hitlerian, the, the Nazis, Mao, and I'm guessing Pol Pot, I'd throw him in there. Yeah, if you think of a percentage of people he had at his disposal to kill, probably so, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's a, in the 20th century, you have, a, you have this coming together of, of secular, a secular uh, you, you have this secular ideology with no moral check. I think that's what Solzhenitsyn would, would put his finger on that. Is that right? Yeah, I think, I, uh, I think he would. I mean, I think that's what... Now, whether it would be possible to um, have a non-secular version of that is not something he addresses. It, it didn't happen, so he doesn't address it. But it's possible that um, there are forms of Islamism which explicitly were based on modern totalitarianism. They're not based on the traditional Islam. They're based on totalitarianism, right? You know. Um, it's a mistake to think of Islamism as Islam or some extreme, it's a different sort of thing. It's possible, I haven't studied enough, that this in power would be the, you know, the, but I don't know. Do they have a theory of physics they can explain? Uh, uh, probably not, but, you know, so it, it's at least theoretically possible that <coughs> you could do this with religion, but I, I don't know. Um, certainly he's not, he's calling it secular, that's what's actually happened over and over again. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, so. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for your very interesting talk. My usual role in these discussions is to introduce complications. Absolutely. And I will do so. Uh, I think I understand why Western intellectuals are a bit chary of Solzhenitsyn. Or a bit. He talks yeah. about truth yeah. in a way which I think invites blindness to your own ideological blinders, uh, for just for two things. First of all, there's no implication for political success as the only thing that counts to cruelty as actually a positive good. Say that again, sorry. There's no implication from worldly success is the only thing that counts to the conclusion that 
cruelty is a positive good. Machiavelli would strongly object to that. You are kind or cruel as the situation requires. You do not prefer cruelty to kindness, according to Machiavelli. I mean, uh, that would seem to be just sensible realpolitik, uh, whatever our moral views. The second point is that there are all sorts of ideologies around. Uh, the ideology of the war against terror, for example, began with a claim that uh, it was our task to, quote, rid the world of evil, uh, included torture, included the excommunication of deviants, including conservatives, including, as it happens, a cousin of mine, Scott McConnell, uh, was ex excommunicated on the pages of National Review. Uh, it proves nothing that he's my cousin, but it happens to be so. <laughs> and was presided over by someone whose uh, uh, supposed maxim was, what would Jesus do? Who, who was this, sir? Oh, George Bush. Oh, I see. George Bush Jr., I by see. the way. Okay. George Bush Sr. Right. is an entirely different kettle of fish, and actually, I have great admiration for George Bush Sr. as an international statesman. I don't think he worked out very well domestically, but that's an entirely different kettle of fish. Uh, sorry, I got, I got my side. You, you don't seriously think that George Bush sent millions of people to slave labor camps and that when he said, you know, what would Jesus do, that, that, that was a justification for changing the laws of physics or sending pe people, come on, come on, be reasonable here. <laughs> an analogy, I'm not a, I'm not a sort of... No, an analogy like that suggests a close identity. It's not, you know. No, I do not believe that. Okay. I mean, what, what is your point? That torture has existed outside the Soviet Union? This is supposed to be an, a, a point? No, the ideology justifies that torture exists outside the Soviet Union. So, I mean, of course it has. Of course it has. <laughs> but there, you don't need an ideology even to justify torture. It works. Let's do it. It's fun. That's not an ideology. I okay. Agree. <laughs> There's, there's been cruelty before. Of course there's been cruelty before. Think of Macbeth, but there's a difference. But the claim <clears throat> that we, are, we have an obligation to rid the world of evil, which is pretty liberal to me, uh, is an ideology. I, I think he meant a particular evil when he said that, the evil of modern terrorism. It's not, I do not think that he meant it in the way that Lenin meant it. There's nothing in George Bush that suggests that he meant things the way Lenin did. <clears throat> But we should try to rid the world of certain kinds of evil to the extent that we can. And, you know, if you're a believer, you do ask what Jesus would do, or Muhammad, I guess. But it, none of that makes you, right? The opposite of totalitarian morality is not complete amorality, which is what, what the only thing that would satisfy you, it seems, right? <laughs> <laughs> No, you said as soon as somebody says, what would Jesus do, that's already puts them in the same class, maybe to a lesser degree, as, come on, then, then what could they do? They'd have to have no moral standard not to be in that class. No, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> okay. No, but of course you don't mean this. You don't say it like you mean it. You say it like you're being provocative, so I'm replying, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Ryan Cristiano. Uh, okay, so this isn't going to be as fun as the last question. Um, but in the Bolshevik uh, ethics section, you talked about the idea that everything's sort of permissible to further the communist utopia. Right. Like that was sort of like the main overarching point. Um, and that idea, like everything is permissible, everything's lawful. Like Dostoevsky talks a ton about yeah. it, and Rose Karamazov, right. obviously, and that's in the 1870s. So why do you? think this idea was discussed so much, and is there anything like uniquely Russian to it? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, the phrase, all is permitted, depending on how you want to translate, all is permissible, um, is a phrase everybody in Russia associated with Dostoevsky, right? Um, it comes in various forms in his, you know, novels, um, simply by itself, um, uh, all is permitted, um, or Sometimes, if there is no God, all is permitted, in, in various forms, okay? Um, and when anybody in the Soviet period uses that particular phrase, and, for example, the Bolsheviks like to use it, yes, all is permitted, 
they clear, everyone clearly means it to be an allusion to Dostoevsky. His, his notion was, right, that if, if you have no, if, there, if you believe that there's nothing in the world except laws of nature, as a materialist, so far as I understand, does, then, you know, uh, here. If I drop this, it falls at 9.8 meters per second squared, if you remember your, your physics. Now I ask you, is that moral or immoral? Well, the question makes no sense. But if all we are are laws, physical laws in operation and on neurons and so forth, then morale, there's no way to derive morality, right, if that's all there is. This is what bothers Ivan Karamazov. This is precisely his argument. And yet he doesn't want to believe it because he is appalled by the suffering of children. That's the contradiction that, um, that motivates him. The recognition that you can't get morality simply from the laws of nature is, you know, the, he sets the problem there. And so whenever the Bolsheviks, you know, try, or others, you know, want to adopt that phrase, they're, what they're effectively saying is, yes, Dostoevsky was right, only we're on the other side. He means this is an argument against um, all is permitted. We're embracing the conclusion all is permitted. Um, this is how Dostoevsky tends to haunt people who are afraid, you know, to mention him too explicitly because he was, the Bolsheviks had a not very favorable view of him. Um, uh, does that, that help at all? Or, I mean, they, they, they know it's from Dostoevsky. I mean, um, uh, we got somebody. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Morrison. We, uh, I, the, the food is coming. We're going to have a, a little reception here. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll stop the questioning there since it's 4.15. Can we just take this one, one person back and then we'll... <laughs> yeah, here. Most of those quotes that you gave from the Gulag or for a wide variety of sources that uh, Solzhenitsyn wrote, Say that, I'm, I'm sorry. Are I'm, most of those quotes that you included in your talk from the Gulag or from a wide variety uh, of writings? <clears throat> um, a lot of them are from Gulag. You mean the quotes from Solzhenitsyn himself. And a few are from um, that novel in the first circle. Um, does that, um, which I think is a really good novel. I mean, he didn't write, not everything he wrote was that. Don't tell Dan Mahoney, I said. Not everything he wrote was great. <laughs> but. but. But some of the stuff he wrote was really, really very good. I also just recommend, you know, the stories of Arlam Shalamov, whom Solzhenitsyn really admired. S-H-A-L-A-M-O-V. His collection is called Kalima Tales, which are, I tell you, as Kalima was where the worst of the camps were and Shalamov was there. Those stories are, uh, as, a, from, as literary masterpieces, are much better even than Solzhenitsyn. They're spec and Solzhenitsyn knew it. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, I really recommend them to you. It's, it's, um, it, it's. S H A L A M as in Mary O V. And it's called, the book is called Kolima, K O L Y M A, Tales. And you, you want the translation by John Glad. There are three translations. Um, the translation makes a difference, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I think you'll really um, be impressed with them as stories. Um, and they'll, they'll tell you a lot, um, but you don't want to read them just for a documentary point of view. You'll get, you know, he's a deep sense of what human life is like and what extreme situations reveal, which he's able to do through, through fiction. Granted, in a realist setting, but they're not documentary. Okay, he's not claiming that this event and that event happened, you know. Yeah. It's more like the background to where the stories happens is documentary, but not the actual stories, yeah. And they're extremely good, so. Um. Well, I want to say that uh, if, if Tolstoy's novels justify the Russian people, then uh, your presentation today really justifies the existence of the Humanities Forum. <laughs> Thank you. Um, please stay and join us for... Uh, for some refreshments, thank you. <laughs>